Welcome back to another episode of Money Talks. This is Hugh Meyer. Hope you're doing well. Remember, we are connecting thought leaders, entrepreneurs, and business experts to you, the small business owner. And today, super excited to have my business partner and chief investment officer of Highline Wealth Partner, Cyrus Amini. In today's episode, Cyrus and I are going to give you guys a recap of the markets from the last six months. We're going to discuss the effect of long-term interest rates and the sensitivity to growth stocks. And finally, we're going to talk about what we think is the outlook going forward for this year. We hope you enjoy this episode. Cyrus, welcome back to the Money Talks podcast. How are you today? Thank you, Hugh. It's, uh, it's great to be back doing, uh, doing well today. Thank you. How about yourself? Doing great. Uh, I thought it was a good time for you and I to discuss what's been going on in the markets. Obviously, a lot has changed, especially in the last six months. Uh, and we're going to get into the whys of that um, in this episode. But first, why don't we just do a very brief, I guess, summary of what we, we've seen as a group in the markets, both equities and fixed income, you know, since call it November of uh, 2020 up until now. Sure, happy to uh, happy to go through it. It's uh, it's certainly been an interesting ride uh, from a geopolitical perspective over the last five six months, and uh, and we have seen uh, much of that reflected in in asset markets. So that includes um, equities um, and especially uh, fixed income and and rates markets. Um, we've um, you know the the dominant. Uh, narrative uh, has has continued to be uh, the coronavirus um, and its uh, potential impact and also current impact um, on the economy, uh, largely the U.S., but also uh, internationally as well in terms of supply chain disruption, which is having a, a I would call it a, a variety of effects um, on different industries. Um, some of it seen in uh, chip shortages. Um, some of it seen uh, in uh, kind of a little bit of a dislocation in in other sectors where it's a little tougher to uh, render services um, at distance. But um, but by and large, I think the kind of the the concern uh, on an existential level of you know our supply chains going to break apart um, that we had you know kind of around you know starting this time last year and, and into the middle of last year. Um, I think a lot of that has faded and combined with the appearance of the um, of several different vaccine, um, both candidates and also, you know, active vaccines that are being administered to the population. Uh, it's been a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. So we've seen um, we've seen equities rally uh, accordingly or risk assets um, rally accordingly, um, although not um, not as much as one might think, given that good news. Um, and then we've also seen um, safety assets um, uh, such as um, uh, treasuries um, and other sovereigns. Um, they have been uh, much more muted relative to the uh, to the risk assets. So fixed income uh, year to date, um, I, I believe uh, both uh, investment grades uh, um, and uh, um, treasuries have been um, have been negative or have been weak weak performers, weaker performers, and uh, high yield. Um, I think was just barely eking out a positive return um, on the year, but um, that that may have changed over the last day or so. So don't quote me on that one. But uh, suffice it to say, it's been equities outperforming um, uh, fixed income, uh, and I am uh, I'm happy to um, get into the whys of that. Um, whenever you like, but um, that's really where things um, have gone, and that's where they stand. That's where they that's where they've gone over the last six months, and that's where things stand now. Thank you, Cyrus. Yeah, let's. It's a that's a great, uh, I guess, entry, if you will, into the to the next part of our discussion because there's definitely under the hood of the markets, there's been some changes as far as what sectors have been outperforming, you know, for much of last year, it was growth, it was high tech that was screaming higher, you know, due to fears of unknowing when the economy was going to, when the global economy, when the US economy was gonna get back going, even with all the stimulus. And what we've seen, again, since call it November, is what we like to call a, a steepening of the yield curve. We've gone from a flat yield curve to a very steep yield curve. And there's mm -hmm. ramifications to what that does to 
capital markets or specificity equi specifically equities. Well, maybe let's dive into what you've seen as far as the yield curve movements. Sure, happy to do it. It's um, it has definitely been a, a very interesting time for the for the yield curve uh, over the last um, <clears throat> over the last months and, and especially the last couple of weeks. Um, so. Um, just by by way of introduction, I think it's it's worth pointing out that um, you know uh, commonly accepted wisdom and um, you know kind of the the historical research um, behind the yield curve um, points to um, two things um, at, at least from the, through my lens. Um, one is that the the short end of the U.S. yield curve is is largely governed by or anchored by. Um, it, where the Fed chooses to set its stated policy rate, which it uh, which it attempts to uh, influence via open market operations such as uh, QE, which in practical terms means buying and selling securities out of the um, New York office of the Fed, um, and that is uh, typically Treasuries and um, uh, agency backed uh, mortgages. Um, and then the long end of the curve, um, and by that I mean, uh, you know, you could say 15 to 30 years, but really mainly focused on on 30 years. Um, that is intended to be, um, or that's theoretically supposed to be a reflection of, you know, what is the what are the longer term growth prospects for the um, for the country uh, in question. So here we're you know we're talking about the U.S. yield curve. So. Where do we see, um, and, and that's a combination of growth and inflation, and um, you know the, the the level of interest rates that we've seen, both on the short end of the curve and on the longer end of the curve, and and the flatness of the curve, meaning um, the the difference between you know the let's say the, um, the you know the the one month uh, or really short term T bills up to you know kind of the one year to three year treasury bills, the difference between their yields and the yields on a 30 year um, US treasury bond, um, they've both been low on an absolute basis. Um, and they've uh, also the, the difference between them, which is known as the, the steepness of the curve, um, has also been very low on, on an absolute basis. So we would call that, you know, the curve was quite flat, as you mentioned earlier. And also the absolute level um, of uh, of interest rates, both on the short end and the long end, um, was low. And to kind of take this full circle back to to where we started, what does that mean, or how do, how do we interpret that? Um, it's that in the short term, markets expect um, uh, the Fed to stick to its um, its word and 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 what it is um, what it is ex explained in the statements. Um, repeatedly over the, the last uh, several meetings, really all of the meetings since the emergency cuts a year ago, which is that they have a strong um, and really kind of unwavering commitment to um, keeping their policy rates low, i.e. Um, the target between zero and, and 0.25% um, until such time as they uh, feel it's appropriate to increase that uh, target range. Um, and for the longer end of the curve, um, you know, it staying muted for so long uh, was a reflection of the fact that, you know, there, A, there was a lot of demand for the securities at that side of the, um, on that end of the curve. Um, global investors needed yield and the 30 year treasury was one of the few places to get it on a relatively uh, risk free basis, um, even when you account for hedging costs. Um, and also that there, there wasn't much um, growth uh, and or inflation uh, priced into, uh, priced into U.S. markets, um, for the next 30 year time period, which when you really think about it, you know, take a step back and look at, you know, a, a 30 year interest rate, uh, of, you know, you know, anywhere between two and 3%. Um, you know, in real terms, that's very close to zero. Um, you know, if you take, you know, one to 2% is the, you know, kind of the, the 10 year range of, uh, of where core inflation has been. Um, uh, those are very, very low measures of, of interest rates and growth. Um, and, and there's a trade off that you make between, um, or they, they kind of play off against each other. There can be healthy inflation that comes along with growth. There can also be unhealthy inflation where, uh, you know, you kind of have inflation outpacing growth. 
Um, and that's when you, um, that's when you can run into serious problems. And, and that's something that we haven't really seen, um, in most, um, it, most investors or at least, you know, I would say 50% investors plus lifetimes. Um, at least that they can remember, we haven't really seen a period of, um, of significantly rising inflation. Um, the last time it happened was when uh, Volcker uh, had to break the back of inflation. Um, I believe it was in the 70s in response to the, uh, the oil embargo, uh, the oil crisis. So um, uh, even though we've seen it before in history, many of the market participants now, um, both institutional investors and retail, um, are, are dealing with this based on what they've learned from, uh, from history. So they're, they're experiencing it or dealing with it secondhand, um, as opposed to having had, you know, hands on experience, which does make a difference in terms of how the market reacts to these things. Yeah. No, thank you for that explanation. That, that was excellent. It's, it's, it's really important that, you know, we all have an understanding of, you know, what the yield curve is telling us and, and, and what's reacting to it and what those ramifications are. Uh, and obviously these times are, we hate, we always hesitate to say it's different this time, but you know, we've never had the amount of stimulus, you know, created by the federal government historically, well, ever um, in this, in this, in this short period of time, we've never had a federal reserve. So, you know, proactive as, as we've now seen it. So we are, the markets are obviously, you know, telling us something and let's, let's go into our next topic or subject because as, as we alluded to earlier, that because the yield curve has, has steepened in the fashion it has, it's had a, you know, a pretty dramatic impact on everybody's favorite growth stocks, which have, you know, clearly underperformed, relative to other sectors like energy, like financials, like industrials over the last six months. And that is, much of that is due to obviously co economic growth prospects improving and the yield curve steepening. But let's, let's explain to our viewers and audience what specifically in, in the yield curve has done to impact and why growth stocks have acted the way they have in the last six months? Mm -hmm. It's a great question, um, Hugh. I think it's a, it is the question that, that most investors and most people have been wrestling with over the, um, over the course of the last few months. And so, you know, there's, there's a couple of different angles that you can take to, um, to attempt to answer the question. There's no, there's no perfect answer. Uh, unfortunately, there, there rarely is. So I would say the first lens to look at it through is one of, um, of perceived safety. Um, the, the, the long end of the yield curve, um, as represented by, you know, 30 year, um, tre treasury bonds, um, it, you know, those are typically referred to as long duration assets. Um, you know, the, the cash flows from those assets are going to be around for a long time. Um, and, and typically when we talk about duration in this context, in the, in the context of the treasury market, um, duration uh, can sometimes be equated with, uh, with safety. Um, so when you see the, um, as has happened uh, recently, when you see the long end of the curve move up rapidly um, and also, you know, a pretty big, uh, you know, magnitude move upward, um, that is meaning the yields move up um, and the prices of those bonds move down. Um, that is an, uh, that is an indication that, um, that effectively people are, um, are, are moving away from, uh, sorry, that, that is a, that's an indication that effectively people are, um, they could be losing, uh, some confidence in the, in the long end of, of the yield curve. Um, they could also be, um, uh, driven by, uh, basically perceived change in relative uh, opportunity value or opportunity cost elsewhere in the market. Um, so, you know, we've had a market um, over the last really, you know, um, you know, three to five years plus, so you could probably extend that out a little bit, where the vast majority of, um, especially U.S. 
um, equity growth uh, in terms of uh, price appreciation has been driven by this basket of growth stocks. Um, and especially with the inclusion of Tesla and the S&P 500, um, you know, you've got the, you know, the tech giants, if you will, um, that have really been driving, um, you know, a, I think it's at least a, a third, um, but really a, a really staggering proportion um, of the growth in the earnings per share um, of the uh, of the major indices and also of, um, uh, of of the performance as well. So what you've seen as the as the yield curve has kind of performed what's called a a, a bear steepener, which is to say the the difference between the short end yields and the long end yields has increased. So if you're looking at the curve, it's gone from flat to being to having a more positive um, uh, slope. Um, it, it's doing so because the market is worried about something, not because the market is um, not because the market is anticipating higher growth rates, which would also uh, which could also theoretically push up the the long end of the yield curve. So this is more about the the market being concerned with um, uh, a you know rates not going anywhere at the at the short end of the of the curve. Um, and also, you know, concerns about the Fed's ability to control the, the long end of the curve and, and really just injects kind of some more uncertainty into whether this, this growth environment uh, or the, the growth friendly environment will be able to continue. And what that's resulted in, uh, to some degree, is a rotation into um, what are traditionally known as uh, value stocks. Um, and that uh, typically encompasses um, sectors such as um, energies, uh, sorry, energy, utilities, um, financials, um, and and they're known as. Um, I won't get into the full um, definition of uh, of what makes a value stock uh, versus a a growth stock, but part of um, the uh, the definition or part of the basic characteristics is that um they have a, a they're considered to have a margin of safety around themselves so they they might not have as high of earnings or earnings per share um but they um you are in theory risking less of your capital um by investing in uh in value stocks um versus growth you're not relying on continually increasing growth um, you're looking at these um, value stocks more as ones that are um, potentially underpriced, um, uh, potentially in sectors or industries that are um, temporarily um, depressed or they're facing headwinds um, because of uh, things going on in the economy, i.e., you know, um, banks in uh, during the financial crisis. Um, uh, in the last year, we've seen, you know, the kind of these um, these structural challenges pop up for um, sectors such as, uh, you know, airlines, uh, you know, gaming, uh, hospitality. Um, that doesn't automatically turn them from a growth sector into a, uh, from a growth stock into a value stock or vice versa. Um, but hopefully it illustrates the idea that, um, you know, the, the, the growthy stocks um, such as the tech giants, um, that have driven so much of the market appreciation over the last years. Um, they have run into um, what I can only call, you know, kind of a, a bit of an air pocket um, that has also been reflected in the yield curve. And uh, there's been quite a bit of uh, capital flowing out of those growth assets, out of those uh, those tech names um, and, and some healthcare names into uh, more value oriented sectors such as energy, financials, utilities, et cetera, um, places that would be considered um, safer um, uh, when you're looking at the, uh, at, the, at the broad spectrum of U.S. equity markets. Hopefully that answered the question. Absolutely. No, thank you for that. Again, it's, it's important that investors really understand you know, what, what dynamics are at play and, and why it's so important to understand you know, the ramifications of the yield curve and, and the movements it has and on specific sectors that, that it can impact. Um, so much appreciated. That was a great explanation uh, of kind of what's, what, what's happening right now. And it's, it continues to, you know, it, it gets focused literally feels like 24 seven right now, as far as, 
you know, from one day to the next, seeing the sectors that are, are, are trading up. And as of the last few days, it looks like the, the long end of the market is again, kind of moving back up again. So we'll have to see, uh, we'll have to see where, where that lands. So using all this as a, as a great backdrop, maybe let's dive into kind of what our thoughts are. You know, we're, we're a long-term shop, but obviously we always have to understand what's happening in the present and what could happen three, six, nine, 12 months. Maybe let's talk a little mm -hmm. bit about what our, what we think, you know, knowing what we know on the stance of the fed, knowing what we know, the federal government wants to continue to provide more stimulus. Where do we think this is all headed? That is, uh, you know, that's the, that's the million dollar question, right? That's the question of the hour. It's, um, you know, I have to, uh, give the disclaimer that, you know, I have no, uh, crystal ball and, uh, it is incredibly difficult to, um, to make, you know, specific, uh, assertions or projections with respect to, to any market. But, um, as you said, we're a, you know, we're a long-term, uh, shop. Um, we have a strategic view, um, that where we try to look, beyond what's happening on a daily or weekly basis and really look on more of a kind of three to five year uh, time horizon. Um, uh, you know, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I would have said, you know, we try to look, you know, kind of through business cycles. Um, and those I think are more historically clocked in at about, you know, five to seven years. But, um, you know, we, we just had a, uh, you know, a 10 year, or the 10 to 11 year bull run. Um, one of the longest in history that was, uh, very rudely, uh, uh, and brutally interrupted by the, um, the, the COVID pandemic. So it's, um, we're, as someone once said, you know, we're, we're cursed to live in, in interesting times. So to, with all of that, um, quasi legal, uh, preface out of the way, um, you know, looking forward, uh, into, let's say the balance of 2021 and we'll, we'll keep the, um, um, we'll, we'll keep the projections, um, uh, there uh, for now. Um, it's one of the key mantras or one of the, the key ideas, um, whether we as in, as investors or portfolio managers like it or not over the last 10 years has been don't fight the Fed. And if you look at the market activity, and the appreciation, um, especially in equities in the U.S., and you map that to um, the different Fed QE programs and basically the um, the Fed's support for the U.S. economy, um, a fairly clear trend emerges where um, when the Fed is accommodative, um, and they've never been more accommodative than they are now, um, risk assets and especially equities, um, have tended to benefit from that. Um, and, and fixed income assets, um, have also benefited from that. Um, and it's kind of been a, a rising tide of liquidity has been raising all boats. That being said, um, there are limits to that, um, to that idea. You know, the, the, the Fed, uh, neither the Fed nor any other central bank has an unlimited ability to pour uh, capital uh, or monetary stimulus um, into markets. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't want to digress too much, but, you know, this does border on or this does touch on the, uh, the question of where is inflation um, and then what are our inflation expectations. And, you know, it, it's, it's a very popular uh, topic. Um, and it's one of the things that the Fed is um, by, by their mandate um, is kind of required to speak to and address at every one of their meetings, including this one. Um, and the Fed has repeatedly stated um, that they are willing to let um, uh, they're willing to let inflation, in, in their own words, I'm doing big air quotes here, to run hot, um, which to them means um, meaningfully over two percent uh, core PCE, which is the the personal. Uh, consumption, uh, per personal consumer expenditure, uh, I think it's a chain deflator uh, index, technically. Um, they're willing to let that measure run hot. So they're willing to allow more inflation for longer um, in order to allow for a, a kind of a, a growth dynamic um, to set in in the, in the broader economy 
And so they don't stifle any um, potential upswing in um, the Main Street economy, um, uh, as well as um, uh, risk asset markets. Um, so they really don't want to want to get in the way of that. Um, so they um, so they've been very clear in their communication as to they want to keep rates um, lower for you know as long as is necessary. Um, in order to um, to basically sustain or to um, uh, or to help support growth. So, what does that mean for the rest of 2021? Um, you know, first and foremost, it does mean you know uh, you know don't fight the Fed. Um, you know, if the Fed um, and many other uh, central banks um, are all simultaneously committing to uh, or continue to commit to um, supporting uh, both financial markets. And also are imploring their um, their respective governments to um, release policy initiatives or to work on policy initiatives that are going to support Main Street and support structural parts of the real economy. Um, that is a lot of firepower, um, both monetary and fiscal, um, that is being uh, aimed at the economy w- with the goal of, of growth and, and hopefully healthy growth. Um, and that's not something that, uh, investors should, uh, should be trying to fight against. That being said, um, there is no guarantee of anything in this world, especially not in financial markets. So, you know, what are the, you know, what are the risks out there? Um, there are, um, there are quite a few, uh, I personally believe, you know, there, there are fewer than, than last year, but. Um, there are always um, risks, and usually they're hiding much closer to home. They're usually hiding in our assumptions as opposed to out on the wings um, randomly, um, like a, a super tanker crashing into the side of the Suez Canal. Um, you know that that that's 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 not going to tank. Uh, sorry, that did not mean for this to be a pun at all, but that's not going to tank global markets. That's just going to cause a lot of logistical problems in the Suez Canal for. Um, who knows? Hopefully, a few weeks, but could be uh, could be much longer. I'm not a canal expert, so um, uh, you know. Well, all I can say is that um, there are um, I would consider them mostly latent risks at this point to um, you know to the market being able to continue its push um, upward. Um, one of them is um, dim- the diminishing marginal returns that um, you get from QE, so from monetary stimulus. Um, and also from uh, potentially from fiscal stimulus as well. That just means the you know, the more money the Fed pours into the market in terms of buying treasuries and buying uh, mortgage securities um, at a, at a certain point, you know, and we've already pretty much reached that point, I believe, with respect to treasuries. I, I don't know if we've reached it yet with respect to mortgages. Um, effectively, what's happening is. Um, is you know the Fed and the Treasury are just handing pieces of paper back and forth. Um, you know there are outside buyers of Treasuries, there are outside buyers of mortgages, but at the primary uh, issuance level, um, you know it's really just a lot of one entity passing it to the other, um, which some people would call modern monetary theory, um, which I won't get into because that is well beyond the scope of this conversation, um, uh, and others might call it. Um, you know, another way to think about it is it's called monetizing the debt. But um, uh, a third way to think about it is that, you know, the um, the Treasury is issuing a lot of debt um, in order to fund the deficit and to fund the spending um, that the government is pursuing on the fiscal side to support the economy. And the Fed is committed to being the main buyer of those securities in order to support markets financial markets from their side of things. So that could also be seen as two entities working in conjunction with each other to um, to protect and, and support markets. So um, I don't, I think the risk of that getting, that support getting pulled away is very low. I would say it's all, it's virtually zero this year, um, uh, especially with the Democrats having the, um, the tie breaking vote in, in the Senate and being able to utilize the budget reconciliation tool um, you know, we're not going to have, um, I doubt we will have uh, stalled fiscal packages and the Fed has already, um, you know, made all the moves that they need to. And they've committed to, um, you know, continued support of, uh, of asset markets. Um, 
one of the, the one of the biggest. So that being said, you know the the risk of the you know the, the supports being the training wheels being taken off, the supports being removed. I think that's low uh, in, in the short term. I don't see inflation uh, in, or inflationary pressures creeping in um, for a variety of reasons. Um, main one being there's no sign whatsoever the wages are set to break out, um, which is usually the primary driver of unexpected inflation, uh, which to, then in turn drives uh, central banks or pushes central banks to rise, uh, sorry, to raise interest rates. Um, at labor market is. Uh, both in the U.S. and in, and and really globally, but especially Europe, labor markets are still quite weak, um, weaker than the unemployment rates would suggest. Um, again, a fuller discussion of that can uh, we can embark on that another day. But um, you know, without that, you know, that's it's tough to find a, a catalyst for inflation. Um, the virus, um, you know, a, another surge, so to speak, another wave um, uh, of virus-related shutdowns is your uh, is likely our uh, biggest, uh, you know, most immediate um, uh, potential risk um, to the economy, uh, both the U.S. economy and the global economy. Um, there has been a lot of economic, what, what we would call, or what economists would call um, scarring over the last uh, year, um, which is to say that, you know, people's, um, uh, your average investor's or person's mindset, um, uh, this last time this really happened was kind of during the Great Depression, um, you know, the mindset of that generation was permanently altered because of the effects that the Great Depression had on their experiences as they were um, children and then young adults. Right. Um, that process can also occur on a shorter time frame, um, such as over, you know, this, uh, this pandemic. So um, the, the scarring effects could lead people to be more cautious um, and hence spend less and save more um, and also, you know, uh, be more um, hesitant or cautious when the perceived risks or problems are on the horizon, um, which just, you know, a more cautious uh, outlook means it's tougher to generate that growth momentum that you would want going forward. So I would view that as a, as a, as another potential risk factor. Um, and, um, you know, there, there are a lot of other smaller ones, but I think the other big one, the two other big ones I would point to is, is one, um, uh, continued strain in uh, in Europe, um, uh, really with respect to whether they will be able to, you know, Brexit somehow happened kind of almost under the radar for most right. people's uh, news timelines. Um, you know, that's that's having a lot of knock on effects now that are um, that, that were predicted um, that aren't that great, <laughs> either for Britain or for the EU. Um, at some point, they're going to have to reckon with, you know, do we want to go and, and really create this full fiscal and monetary union? Or do we want to turn this into a, you know, a different type of hybrid model that is, you know, more strictly designed just to prevent us from going to war with each other um, and perhaps lend, you know, some economic assistance here and there um, for our mutual benefit. But we basically pull back from the idea of a full union. Um, that is a, is a risk that has been on the table for years. Um, they continue to kick the can down the road. There's no reason to think that that's going to get um, resolved, that that will meaningfully change this year. Um, but Brexit could very well be a catalyst for some interesting um, decisions being made there. Um, but I would counter that by saying, uh, sorry, economist two-handed response. I would counter that by saying Draghi being um, brought in as, um, as the head of Italy's government so quickly um, to me is a sign that uh, the Italians, who are usually one of the more difficult members of the EU to predict and to deal with, um, have brought in a, 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 a through and through technocrat with a great deal of experience dealing with all of the members of the EU um, and also dealing with crisis management. Um, into their government at a time when uh, they need to get their act together. So I view that as a big positive for Italy and also um, a, a positive for um, uh, for the EU overall. So that's a, that's another risk. And the the last one is probably the um, is is probably the biggest, um, and uh, it's also the the toughest to uh, predict in any way, shape, or form. And that is the evolution of our relationship with China. Um, uh, you could also throw Russia in there as kind of a smaller um, subplot, 
But um, there's a lot of damage done over the course of the last four to five years um, to our relationship with China. Um, there, um, it doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, there are outcomes where, um, you know, kind of the world's two uh, superpowers, if you'd like to think of it that way, um, can work together um, to help the world kind of grow and build um, out of this, you know, shared, um, you know, kind of disaster, this pandemic that we've all been dealing with together as, you know, as a, as a species, um, as a global society. So um, whether we take that path or one where, uh, you know, there's kind of, I won't say continued antagonism, but let's say, you know, ramped up antagonism between those two parties, um, that would have very many knock-on effects for very many different markets um, and, um, and would, and econ- whether it's an economic war, whether it's a currency war, um, or whether it would, uh, you know, hopefully it never does, but if it were to devolve into an actual military confrontation, um, that would be, um, a devastating scenario for, um, for global financial markets, uh, in my opinion. But, um, uh, I assign, currently assign a, a fairly low probability, a quite low probability to, you know, military conflict and, um, relatively low probability to the other, you know, outright antagonism. If anything, you're likely to see more of the same. Uh, and by that, I mean, um, you know, China um, really pushing to have a domestically driven economy and to uh, increase its sphere of influence in the Eurasia region um, and the U.S. attempting to do the same um, with respect to Europe where it can in Latin America, and also to keep kind of the North American uh, alliance uh, alive and well. So uh, I'm, I'm not surprised um, to see overtures already being made to, to Canada and Mexico. Um, I think further overtures will be made. Um, I think um, you know this administration is going to put a lot of work into ensuring that our allies stay close so that we can um, have enough leverage to hopefully work with the superpower on the other side of the world to um, uh, to, to help growth for the um, for the longer term, uh, because that possibility is uh, that opportunity is there, um, but it does take two to tango. So hopefully they figure that out, but we'll um, we'll see. So those are th- those are the risks as I see them. You know, there are um, there are other ones. Um, uh, there there are always other risks out there. Um, you know, I, I think if I were to um, if I were to point to one that is perhaps uh, that that sits in the back of my mind that um, seems to be overlooked by um, by many people, um, especially many strategists on Wall Street, um, it is um, kind of in that vein of scarring, you know, economic scarring that I talked about earlier. Um, you know, we've we've lost half a million Americans um, to uh, the pandemic, or, you know, close to closing on five hundred and fifty thousand. Um, and, uh, you know, approximately 3 million, 3 million more to other, all of, you know, every other cause, um, other than, uh, COVID, um, over the last 12 months. Um, that's the most people that have, um, died in the U.S. in a, a single calendar year since, uh, the height of World War II. Um, they're, uh, all basic growth assumptions within economics are built on several, uh, blocks. One of which, uh, the first of which, I believe, is population growth. Um, More people doing more work, all contributing to a higher level of growth. If your population isn't growing, you know, what happens to that assumption? Uh, I I don't know if I'm qualified to say, as I don't have a PhD in economics, but all I can say is, um, you know, we we saw in the financial crisis the effect of um, uh, having the wrong assumption that, you know, uh, asset prices for houses would continue to rise as opposed right. to either plateau or go down. I think making similar assumptions was something even as, um, as, uh, essential as population size, um, could also be a, a very big risk, um, to, uh, people's projections and expectations. So we'll see. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, I do think there's a lot of positive tailwinds to the market, largely coming from uh, governments and from central banks. Um, but, uh, you know, valuations are high. Uh, you know, most um, uh, asset markets are at their all-time highs or very close to them. Um, it's difficult to find yield out there. 
Um, there are, there's a lot of money uh, chasing um, fewer opportunities, it seems. And, and no one seems to have any idea how the story should evolve or end. So that is a, that's more uncertainty than I'm comfortable with. So, um, you know, there's, there's going to be some volatility ahead for sure. Um, and, but I, in the short term, I do believe that the, um, uh, all of the different stimulus measures, both fiscal and monetary, um, uh, should be sufficient to maintain the, um, kind of the, the, the upward trajectory of, uh, of, of growth rates and hence, uh, financial market performance. So. Sorry for the long-winded answer, but it is a that's a tough question to tackle. So there's a yeah. lot of different parts to it. Not a, no question of that. It's um, it, it's always yeah, I appreciate that that response because there's just there are several, you know, there's several risks out there, and there's always the ones we don't see, which are are the most dangerous. But it's helpful to at least set the course and help people understand kind of you know, how the table is set right now. And, you know, knowing, knowing and being educated is, is, is extremely important, especially in this, in this time. So again, Cyrus, it was, it was great to touch base with you. Always look forward to our conversations. There's never a, uh, a small list of uh, topics discussed. Thank, thank you to our, you know, the capital markets and, the government and the Fed. So uh, we always have plenty to, to, to go over and mull and, and, and think about. So again, thank you for being here with us today. And uh, we will definitely uh, reconvene over the summer and see where everything is. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Hugh. It's been a pleasure. Um, and uh, thanks to all your listeners. And uh, we'll speak to you soon. Thank you again, Cyrus. Thanks, everyone, for being here today at Money Talks. We'll be back next week with another episode. Everyone take care. Thanks again.